the children may now proceed for their Sunday school. And today we have uh, our elder Derek to give us the message today. I thought doubt and disbelief from John 10, 28 and from Hebrews 6, verse 4 to 6. For those who don't know who Derek is, uh, you are probably on Zoom. And uh, so uh, Derek has been with us uh, for a long time and uh, he's worked with an AI company with a father and a proud father of two. So let's welcome other Derek from his side today. Good morning. Thanks for having me back again. Um, today we are continuing sort of the second part in our series on belief. Um, just now, as we took the holy communion together, uh, Pia mentioned the two things. She said that we are no longer our own self. Let's see everyone got to. So the question is, uh, uh, can we go back to our own self? And if we do, are we still safe? Second question, uh, second thing that Jan said that I think everyone going to is that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. You know, it sounds very good and we all agree, you know. But what if we willingly want to separate us? So last week we looked at what it means to believe, to be saved, what it means to connect the idea of believing and seeing, what it means to be willfully blind, which is to see the plain truths of God and the world, but decide not to accept it. In, in Christianity, the idea of salvation is commonly described as a gift, a gift from God. But if we reject the gift once, reject it twice, we take it enough time, uh, we are told that the chance to actually believe in Jesus will be taken away. But if you harden your heart, Harden again, harden again. God will then harden your heart and you will no longer be able to respond. So, this raises a lot of uh, questions around what it means to believe and what happens when people stop believing. So, these are the issues that I want to look at today as a follow up from last week on will believers lose their salvation? They stop believing. Or Sometimes you will hear people say, maybe they're not true believers to gain with. For those that are struggling, how can we be assured of our salvation? No, it's very common for Christians to have doubts, right? Uh, to have questions about their faith. I want to start by stating uh, something very important so that in case after this slide, we have got the gist, uh, what the gist of the messages. This is something that most of you probably already know, uh, but it's good for us to be very clear about this. Uh, when I search for images for dark, because this was one of the first things that came up, and I thought it quite nicely represents what some people think, which is that doubt, which is having questions, is a sign of unbelief. Right? In this picture, you can see that doubt is pointing to a bit different direction as to be in But this is not true. Doubt is not the opposite of belief. Doubt is about asking questions. It's about searching for answers. This belief is about rejecting Jesus, arriving at an answer that excludes Jesus. In other words, you can accept Jesus, but still continue to ask questions about him. You can ask questions about God. You can ask questions about the world. Someone put it uh, quite nicely this way, saying that Christians were encouraged to simply believe, but not to believe simply. You know, God gave us the power of reasoning, of logic, to learn, to grow. If we don't understand, we must ask questions. So this is a very important thing as we look at this topic of doubt and disbelief, which is that doubt is not disbelief. 
doubt is actually part of what it means to believe in Jesus. So, this is an important sign. So, no, uh, this sign is wrong. In 2017, a uh, survey, you know, usually Christian surveys are mostly in America. There's a survey that tried to understand why Christians doubt. And one of the findings is that two in three Christians have doubts. They have questions about God, they have questions about God and Christianity. I think this number is uh, grossly underestimated. I don't think it's two in three. I, I think that almost everyone uh, Charles Spurgeon, which is a famous Christian theologian, he said this. He said that when a man says, I never doubt, it is quite time for us to doubt him. You know, someone that says that he knows everything, it's time for you to question what he will do. So the point is, having questions of about Christianity is normal. There is nothing unusual or shameful. And on this slide, uh, are some real questions that people have over the years uh, collated. You can see these are the common ones in the Christian guides, in FAQs, uh, about Christianity in general. Uh, as I go through, I've definitely certainly, I've definitely asked myself all of them before, uh, and repeatedly. You know, sometimes these questions we don't ask, answer, and then they, they are satisfied. So I call them like old friends. So they come to visit you once in a while, and then you always stay in touch with them somehow. You, know, you can think about it, and then you know, a few years later, it comes back. So today, when we talk about doubts, we're not trying to address all of them. As mentioned earlier, we are looking at the one that specifically deals with the issue of salvation. Can I lose my salvation? Am I truly saved? And it is not only important because it is a topic that the Bible talks about. But I think it is also something that we are confronted with in our reality. How many of you know this book, A Kiss Dating Divine? This is the type of age revealing question. Who knows this? Only my generation. That means you're not in the thing. <laughs> But this was a book that was super popular when I was a youth. Almost every other youth I know had this book. I also have this book by the way. It's trying to frame sort of a biblical perspective on dating. So what does the Bible say about it? But in 2019, the author, Dr. Harris, he made a shocking admission on Instagram. He said, I'm not a Christian anymore. So you can imagine growing up, you read this book, you know, oh, this is what this is, this is how it works, what you know. But all the medical principles and the author in your lifetime decides that he's not a Christian anymore, what he says is no longer there. But what happened? And maybe some of you do not know of this songwriter called Marky Sampson. Do they know? I, I didn't know his name. But I think you'll be very familiar with his songs. God is great. God is great. Uh, Jesus, you are my best friend. Jesus, you are my best friend. Maybe the last one to the end of the uh, you see here. Uh, uh, when I was younger, uh, so Jesus died, believe in me when I was uh, the end of the year. So basically, these are all songs that um, a lot of uh, evangelical Christians have sung. Again, a bit age revealing when I was young. All the songs I sang before, I've been pouring out whole heart at me and so around the same time as Joshua Harris, uh, the, again the, the songwriter he posted on Instagram and said, time for some real I'm genuinely losing my faith. And it doesn't bother me. He says that my songs are actually shallow. They are as shallow as faith. So why do you all sing it as if I'm worshiping God? So these are the questions and I'm not looking at condemnation. I'm not asking whether they were born again to begin with whether these groups or songs are good for them. My point is the struggle is right? It is very near us and it can happen to any of us. Even for my own family, you know, we, we came here to worship, but my sister no longer worships. She was a leader and she no longer comes to church. Uh, my younger sister, Lydia, 
again, she is not here. She went, then she came back. You know, what, what does it mean? How do we think about the salvation, the status of our loved ones? It can happen to them, it can happen to any, any of us. And some of you know that uh, I'm currently attending some part-time classes in the Bible school. And most of us students, we go in with some idea of the God. Because we kind of have some doctrine, some theology that learn in Jesus. But we will quickly realize that God doesn't fit into our box. This is a comment that we are going to fit into my own If you try to fit God in your own box, you will be used. There are always things that stick out. And when I joined SBC, every lecturer, every dean at the start of the year, they will say the same thing. They say that don't lose your faith. It's very common for people to go through school and lose their faith because they are exposed to so many different ideas, different ways of interpreting the Bible, different questions. So these are things that make this question a real part. So can a, question, can a Christian lose their salvation? So what I want to do is to first look at what the Bible says. Uh, there are some passages that say no. Some passages that say yes. So what, what can we you know, reconcile this? And uh, how can we apply what we learn? How do we deal with the doubts about our salvation and this view? So, of course, as I try to present a balance view, uh, I also need to let you know that, of course, I'm coming with some presentation, I have some bias. Right? My answer is no. Are you happy? <laughs> but I want to bring you through the journey of how we can look through the passages and arrive at a balanced but biblical worldview. Okay, so to help us get clarity uh, as, as the topic and the uh, verses indicate, we'll be looking at two key passages that are commonly used to support the no and the yes position. No, uh, cannot lose, yes can lose. When discussing this topic, I think you might also commonly hear people use some labels, which I really don't like, but it's confusing, like Calvinist that believes no believer cannot lose salvation. Or you might hear the other term called Armenian. Yes, a believer can lose salvation because he has free will. He can decide. So I just want to say, like most of you here, I believe I'm neither Calvinist nor Armenian. Uh, we just want to study the scripture, let the word speak for itself. If after this presentation, uh, you decide to call me Calvinist or Armenian or Calvinistic Armenian or Armenianistic Calvinian, it's fine. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't also mean anything. It's like saying Singaporeans like Chakritel. Then whoever is Chakritel is Singaporean. There is some association, but it's too over generalization. So I hope that we can focus on the text, on the word, and not on certain uh, labels, which are helpful but not helpful in this book. So the first text we are going to look at is John chapter 10. Please turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 10. Let's start at verse 24 to get some context. So turn with me to John chapter 10, verse 24. So 24 is six. So the Jews... Uh, which means the Jewish leaders, the Jewish uh, representatives, they gathered around him, which is Jesus, and they said to Jesus, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. So basically what is going on is that Jesus and the Jewish leaders have been having this huge ongoing debate about whether Jesus is from God, whether Jesus is God. Uh, for some of us that were here last week, we look at John chapter 9. It's the same context, the same background. Is Jesus really God? The Jews were divided. Many believed, but many rejected and they wanted to kill him. And these are the ones that are asking him the question, the ones that want to kill him. And at this point here, actually Jesus was at the end of his public ministry. Three months later, he will die. Crucified by the same people who asked him. And after this incident, he will actually withdraw from the crowd. So this is to give you a bit of a background on what's happening in this uh, story. Verse 25, we see Jesus reply. He answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. 
So these are the unbelievers. They refuse to accept this man. The works that I do in my father's name bear witness about him. His miracles, his healings, and so on. But you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. So he's talking about the Jews who rejected him. On the other hand, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. And this is the key verse that we're looking at today. I give them, I give my sheep eternal life. And they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. So there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, in fact, we took, I think, four Sunday sermons in God at the end, about seven years ago. But I will only focus on the two things that are relevant to our question here. Right, there's a lot more background, a lot going on, I am, and so on. But we're looking at the question, can Christians lose their salvation? This is one of the key passages that are used to support the no, Christians cannot know, Christians cannot lose. So we want to look at two things. Firstly, who are Jesus' sheep, or what we call true believers? I prefer the term followers uh, by the same. This includes both Jews and Gentiles. So there's a long uh, build up to this where he talks about himself, the good shepherd, he introduced this idea of shepherd and the sheep. And notice that there are five characteristics of Jesus' sheep. First is belief. Right? The not my sheep, don't not believe, so my sheep believe. And we saw last week, right? Believe is about trusting, submitting, putting faith in Jesus, which is evidenced by responses. That Jesus is the Son of God, that he's sent by the Father. Second, hear. My sheep hear my voice, which means not just listen, but understand and recognize. Right? You hear we hear a lot of voice, a lot of voices, a lot of sounds. But when you say you hear my voice, means I know ah, this is Jesus' voice. Right? You pick up the phone. Now this AI can you get all these voices so a bit dangerous. But what does it mean to hear Jesus' voice? Which is to know Jesus through his word. That is his voice. Three. Jesus knows them. That means they have a relationship. And earlier in the text, he says that, I know my sheep because my sheep do the will of my father. It's not just a, oh, let's be friends, right? Those that do the will of his father are the sheep. We saw this uh, last week as well. Not just know about Jesus, but know Jesus. And some of you might uh, recognize this uh, term from uh, something else that Jesus said in Matthew. He says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, enter. Not everyone who casts out demons in my name, do mighty works, miracles in my name, you can do all that. But if I do not know you, depart from me. So this is what it's not whether you know him, he must also know you. I know you. Number four, they follow me, which talks about a life of discipleship, obedience. And one characteristic that we can't really see, but Jesus tells us is that these sheep were given to me by the Father. And the word given here is in the past tense. It's done. It was already given. Uh, Paul tells us in Ephesians that God chose his children in him before even the foundation of the world. Right? That we could be holy and blameless. So it's already done. Whoever that has been given to Jesus has already been given to him. And what about this sheep? Can we tell from what Jesus is saying? Which is the second point. We see that Jesus is absolutely clear that he and his father, not just him, he and his father, will keep their sheep from falling away. This, in this context, from losing eternal life. There is a set of four promises. Number one, Jesus says that my sheep will have eternal life, or what we call salvation. Number two, they will never perish. And the language here is very strong. He's saying that they shall never, in no way, cause themselves to be destroyed. They will not lose 
that eternal life must be given to them. Number three, no one will snatch them out of my hand. It rests not on what the sheep do, but on the shepherd's ability to hold. That's the most important part about this promise. And in addition to not being able to snatch out of Jesus' hand, which is already untenable for a Christian, it says that no one is able to snatch out of the Father's hand. And he qualifies by saying that God who is Above all, he will hold us fast. That means if the most powerful, the greatest person can, can hold you, then what it implies is that it's impossible for anyone else who is below him to step him. Of course, it's a reference to the devil. So there are four promises here, and I believe that the teaching here is direct and it's clear. There is not a lot of room for interpretation. And the conclusion is that in, in Christ, which is the key word, in Christ, our salvation is pure. So if we want to know whether the guarantee of um, John 10, 28 applies to us, we have to ask ourselves whether we match the description of Jesus' sheep. Do we believe? Do we hear his voice? We might not hear it completely understand it completely because no one can understand God's revelation perfectly. But it means that we are interested in his voice, interested in what he says in the word. And we want to understand it, want to ask questions about it. Do we know him? Do we have a relationship with Jesus? Do we follow him? And again, this following is not perfect obedience as we learn in 1 John. Even those who walk in the light still sin. And the pastor always says that we are not sinless, but we sin best. It does mean that over the course of our lives, we are striving to be obedient. If these things are true of us, then we are safe. Because the promises on the left, which are very strong promises, repeated promises, clear promises, the whole truth, not because we are perfect, but because God is. And as we sang just now, it's because he loved us and gave himself for us. So long as we are with the good shepherd, the devil cannot snatch us out of his hand. There are also other New Testament passages that talk about the same. So clearly this is a key text, but there are a lot of passages that support the same teaching. So I've listed the ones here, we're not going to go through them. I've bucketed them in several categories, you know, in case you want to do your own study, you get a slide from me, you can take a photo. The first category, which is to me the most direct one, the most clear teaching that we just looked at, that Jesus can and will safeguard to believers. The rest are a mix of suggestions, implications, teachings, and how we can have confidence. And I just want to point out one, which was comforting to me and taught me a lot about whether we can have assurance of salvation in 1 John 5 to him. So the Apostle John writing to Christians, he says that, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. So very clearly, he's writing to the believers, right? They believe in the name of the Son of God. That you may know that you have eternal life. So this tells me two things. One is that they are actually true believers, even during the apostles' time, that they do not know whether they have eternal life. They believe, but they still do not know. So Apostle John is writing to them, say, I'm trying to all these things that you may know, have the full assurance, these people who are asking the same questions you're asking to me, you can have assurance. And secondly, is that he says that this assurance is possible. Right? He said you can know. If not, he won't be writing to you so that you will know. So how can we have this assurance if it were possible to lose our salvation? And if such assurance is achievable by humans, from our perspective, then salvation must be secure. So this is one side of the story. Okay, so far so good. Now we're going to look at the other side of the story, where people have also raised many biblical messages to counter this idea, taking a completely opposite stance. Again, I'm just listing down here so that you can go to them yourself. Uh, there are five categories that I found uh, based on all the verses that talk about 
uh, possibility of losing your salvation. I will not go through the bottom four because I will just summarize the bottom four saying that these are what I call indirect arguments. They do not explicitly say, and you will not find a verse that say a Christian lose salvation. You will not find this verse. These are examples, uh, implications, infer from certain uh, languages. So they're what I call indirect. Only the top one, which is what I consider the most direct and is used most commonly to justify uh, why Christians can lose their salvation. This is the one we want to look at in the interest of time. So in a way, I'm taking two groups, then I take the, the, the two champions, David and Goliath, and make them find each other. Then say we have David win or Goliath. But there's a lot of there's a whole body of text that again I put it up here. I encourage you to study them on your own. Uh, actually, please study them on your own. Uh, we'll be happy, of course, to go deeper into this, but don't take my word, don't take the pastor's word, just take God's word. So, Hebrews 6, verse 4 to 8. Again, in your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 6. Starting in verse 4. It says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, to restore them again to repentance. Okay, so this is the text, and then it goes on to explain a lot more what happens to them, the land, the burn. So the question we have is, who is these people that the author is referring to? Right? If it refers to Christians, then clearly it implies that something bad can happen to them when they go back to their old ways, right? Or does it refer to unbelievers? So the text starts off with a very strong word called impossible. So it's not really meaning like it's difficult. It means that it's without possibility. It's the same word that the Bible uses when they describe that it is impossible for God to lie. So it's a very strong, very definitive word. And this group of people here, they experience four spiritual privileges or benefits or experiences. First, they are enlightened, which is the word used in scripture to describe Christians that understand, like what we studied last week, right? Your eyes are open. You can see. You can discern spiritual truth. But it's also used for non-Christians in the sense that Jesus brings light to everybody. He's the light of the world, not just light of Christians. So used for both Christians and non-Christians, but generally understanding spiritual. Number two, have tasted the heavenly gift. So this case sounds very fitting, but actually this case is very deep and very experiential. It's the same word that uh, is used to describe when Jesus tasted death for every man. It's not conceptual, it's not abstract. He died. He tasted death. This is used in Hebrews 13 as well. So it's a very deep experience of this heavenly gift. But we are not told what this heavenly gift is, which is uh, where the problem starts to come out. Of it. it can mean salvation, because we know that salvation is a gift, maybe. It can mean maybe Holy Spirit, because we know Holy Spirit is sent as a gift. It can maybe refer to God's word, because God's word is also a gift. So we are not told what this really gift is. And then we see that also shared in the Holy Spirit, which means uh, fellowship together with the church body, fellowship, uh, and then tasting goodness and powers. Powers here is miracles. I mean, you know, up the, performing miracles. As well. So these are very real, not abstract. These are very real, impressive uh, spiritual resume in that sense. Uh, at least humanly speaking, if you see someone that check, 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 check you'll probably think he's a prophet or a very religious person, very spiritual person, based on what we should observe. Here comes the first difficulty, which is, which is that none of these are words that also uniquely describe salvation. If the author has said, those who have once been born again, or those who have once been saved, well, they're very clear. Very clear, God's born again and saved main salvation, right? But he uses some words that seem to can refer to believers, but also can refer to unbelievers. 
right? So there's some ambiguity here that makes it difficult to interpret this passage. And then the difficulties uh, compound with all the words. And I will just highlight three difficulties to this passage. Number one is a translation issues. There's this phrase there that I highlighted, and then have fallen away. Some translate as if they fall away. That means hypothetical, right? If they fall away. You find this in the KJV, the NKJV, which suggests hypothetical. But most translations have this one for us and then have in ESV, NIV, NLT, all this uh, 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 translation, which I think is the right one, which means that the author is not talking about hypothetical people. He's talking about real people. So when he writes this letter to the Hebrew, the people that receive it, they should know who these people are, that enlightened, da -da 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 -da, but have fallen away. To them, they know, right? They know who these people are. It's not a hypothetical story. But again, translation difficulty, what does this word mean? Second is a, a use of rare words. This word fallen away is only used one time. So we know that words that are used one time in the Bible are very difficult to interpret because there's no other places to find data. The word itself means to fall alongside the road or to depart from the truth. But we can't tell, uh, number one, if it's lesser or worse or the same as the typical falling away. Because there's another word not falling away, apostasy, that is used to describe false teachers or the, in the rest of the Bible, but this is not that word. So we can't tell whether it's a less degree, a more heavier degree and so on. So the, the rare words, again, what does falling away mean? We don't really know. Number three, which is that you kind of have to make some indirect linkages because here it says restore them again to repent. Again, if they said restore them again to salvation, then but, but restore them to repentance. Repentance is what is turning away, right? From something to something. In the Bible, turning away from sin to God. It is part of belief, but it's not exclusive to belief. Right? We see that uh, in the Bible, Christians can repent. Unbelievers can also repent from their actions. God can also repent, turn his mind. Um, so we, we don't know. What does it mean to restore to repentance? We just know that they might not be able to repent, but does it mean that they are no longer saved? And what exactly is so severe about this falling away that God to say no more chance, no more chance to repent? There's something very severe about. It. So again, uh, these are some of the difficulties that I just want to uh, show. But how can we interpret this? I'm I'm a visual person, so I'm going to show you a visual diagram. I hope it makes sense to you. So this is our typical framework, right? If you're a believer, you're safe. And just now we saw promises in John chapter 10, secure. If you're unbeliever, unbeliever you're not safe. So this, this uh, Hebrews 6 verse 4 to 6 has been interpreted in many, many ways over the last 700 years. Uh, uh, four, 500 years. Um, but there are four main ways that I want to show you. One, is that what we are discussing, which is real. A Christian can lose his salvation. Right? So believer, safe already, but he turned his way, he fall away, he lose his salvation. Okay? So this is the first interpretation. But this contradicts the clear teaching on God's ability and responsibility to guard the believer. So you can say at best, both are true, but it's a mystery to us. We don't really understand. It. Which is uh, a position that a lot of mainstream uh, churches have taken. I just don't know the Bible teaching both possible, but not very satisfying. Number two is what I alluded to a bit earlier. It's a hypothetical situation. It will never occur. That means in theory, a Christian can fall away. But in reality, you will not because God will keep saving. So the, it basically is about, like let's say, a child like where I bring Jonah on across the road. I tell him, don't cross the road without holding my hand. Right. I can force him, which is I tie our hands together, or I can just tell him and believe that because he trusts me, he deserves me, he will not do it. So theoretically, he can cross the road without holding my hand, but in reality, he will never do it because he will always hold my hand. That means it's hypothetical to never. So a believer can, but will not fall away. Again, I don't. I think that a lot of uh, uh, scholars believe this is the main position. But I feel it's also a little bit unsatisfactory because it's a bit speculative. It's based on logic. But I think in the text suggests that it is speculative. And I, I can say 
if I'm the receiver of the letter of Hebrews, I will kind of know who these people are. You know, it sounds like I know who these people are. Also, it's not common in the Bible to use very hypothetical arguments to talk about salvation. So, possible, but not very satisfactory to me. Three is uh, also another common one is that, oh, they're not true believers. But not in the not in the way we commonly think of. It's probably talking about those that were in the church for a long time, they had appearance of salvation, but at some point, they went back to their own ways. They went back to their own religion. They went back to relying on themselves. Uh, and we see uh, in the Bible examples of many people who have deep knowledge of God's truth, but, you know, turn away like uh, the Pharisees, like Balaam. Balaam even prophesied, he spoke to God, and everything, but his ultimate judgment is that this guy is going to be fine. There are people who experience God's power, uh, perform miracles, miracles like, like Judas, you go about demons, you're part of the crowd. Uh, the high priest in Jesus' time, he was a bad guy, but he also prophesied uh, Israel, everyone left Egypt, but only a few made to a promised land. So there are people that clearly benefited from all the spiritual privileges, but were not believers. So this interpretation suggests that the impressive spiritual description are applicable for non-believers too, which is possible because, like I said, there are no definitive terms which uniquely describe salvation. So I feel that the text allows the interpretation of this and other passages also uh, gel with this understanding. But there's also a fourth interpretation, which is, actually, this is not talking about salvation at all. It's talking about believers who backslide. They backslide to this point that they are no longer qualified for service. God will not use them anymore. Uh, they will be like Lot. You know, you choose to stay in Sodom. You cannot be fruitful in Sodom. You are safe, but safe through fire. Right? There's nothing, no fruit to show the life. We also read about this in First Corinthians. So it's not about losing salvation. It's that there's no chance for you to repent and then be fruitful to serve God again. I think the text does allow for this interpretation. That means they're talking about believers, but who no longer can be used by God. Um, there are other passages that again say the same thing. Paul in, in first Corinthians say that no, I, I will hand you over to say because it's better for you to destroy your body, to kill you, than to destroy your soul. But it's better that you become useless in this world than lose your salvation. So there is some uh support for this. So for me, I believe that three fits the overall context best, but humanly speaking, we can only see one because two, three, four are all you cannot only really see. You cannot know what happens at the end. Humanly speaking, we can only see in someone who's less spiritual uh, denounces his faith. So I think there's a dual dimension here, which is from our perspective, we can only see if you know, a Christian leader or a pastor or me or anybody you knows any use of faith. That's what we can see. But what we cannot see is whether they are in category two, three, four. You know, whether it's a hypothetical, whether they're unbelievers to begin with, or they just look at home. But for me, the context suggests that three is the most uh, uh, suitable in the book of Hebrews, because the book of Hebrews is to show that Christ is better than the days of Christ. Christ is better than any old religion, or old way, old world view that we used to have before you were a Christian. And these Jews, the letter to the Hebrews, these are Jewish believers. They are tempted to go back to Judaism because when they stick to Christianity, they are persecuted. They cannot go to the temple. So there's a temptation to, okay, maybe it's the same, you know? Maybe maybe Jew, Judaism, and Christianity is the same, right? The same foundation, same God. But the author is saying, no, it's not the same. Christianity is much better. Don't go back there. Don't go back there. And throughout the book of Hebrews, he keeps using different groups of people to contrast, which is why I believe that he's contrasting between two groups of people here. And you can see these uh, boxes here. Basically, in the chapter 6 itself, uh, is that we see two groups of people. First, the author says, let us grow, us. Let us grow to spiritual maturity. The author is talking about himself. Let us grow. Then he says, don't be like them. Don't be like these people who look very spiritual, but in the end are not. He uses the word them. Then in verse 9, he says, 
but for you, I think you are better. You are better than them. So there's this them and us contrast, which I feel that this group of believers here in Hebrews 6 is talking about those that ultimately they came close but they fell short. Like the parable of the different soils, some soil, the seed lands and actually grows, right? By choke. Or the plants were scorched and they withered because they have no firm root. Ultimately, only one type of soil can bear fruit. So I think this gives uh, us a better understanding of the complexity of the reality. So I just want to say, compared to this one, is that uh, this is the theoretical framework. I'm not suggesting you use this and, oh, I think uh, you are here. Oh, you, I think you are here. No, it's not practical. It's to help us understand God's promises. It's not to allow us to bucket or to practical. Because the truth is, we don't know, right? In the final analysis, we would know. But in the current analysis, we cannot tell. So I don't want you to take this slide and then when your pastor is here, or you, wow, yesterday you didn't come to church. I think you're here. Hey, you come to church next week. Oh, you're back to one. You know, it's not a diagram for usage. It's a diagram for understanding abstract concepts. Okay, and the best way to do this is you put yourself there. It's fine. How, how can you even tell? Right, and this comes to the, the last part of our application, which is, can the Christians lose their salvation? I believe that the Bible is clear. That those who believe will have eternal life, not because of our own efforts or merit, but our security is found in Christ. We found in God's promises, it's found in his ability. But we do not know whether our faith is real or genuine. Because the Bible tells us we don't even know our own heart. And the Bible also tells us that only God knows what is in your heart and in my heart. So it's what we said, you know, it's a theoretical framework. It's promises, but how do we actually live it out? And we know that, you know, today, you know, are you a Christian? Yes. And, oh, yes, 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 yes. But you know that saying, I believe, is not good. Enough. In fact, I think uh, in, in Singapore, we have this term, NATO, right? No action, talk only. But because it's easy to say yes. Um, it's easy to say yes to Christianity. It's easy to say yes, oh, I will turn from this addiction. Oh, I will see you next week. You know, I will be this and this. But we need more evidence to help us understand, to help us see if we can really have the assurance of salvation. Because it is possible. So how do we get there? Which is the last slide. Instead of giving you a list of this is what you should do to have assurance, I want us to change our lenses a little bit. I want us to put ourselves in the position of the one that has doubt, that has questions. Why do we have this question about Christianity? Why would I question my salvation? Again, the list is long, but I'm just going to use four that I myself have experienced and what I think are common to people. Number one, doubts about our salvation happen when we do Bible study or when we have a with our friends, our family, when suddenly someone asks you a question and puts you on the defensive. How do you know that you are a they can study the Actually, I don't really know. No, so these are doubts happen. What does the Bible really say? Are there general rules or are there exceptions? Are there conflicts? How do we explain it? It's not possible that there's no conflict. Right? That is not, it's not real. God's word is very profound. So as we investigate uh, God's world through God's word, these questions will come out and the doubt will come out. And like I said at the start, doubt is not this. It's common. It's part of growth. It's part of growth of maturing in Christ. Ask questions. You don't have to be ashamed. As we go from our initial faith or inherited faith, you go to your personal faith. Go through this series of doubts and questioning. They help you grow. So the other thing you can do is doubt is inherently isolating. It makes you feel alone. Maybe I'm the only one with this situation. You know, maybe I'm the only one that thinks this way. So I would suggest that if you are struggling with doubts, with questions, it's important that you find friends who you know and who know you, that you can discuss, confide in, preferably uh, face to face. Uh, those that uh, have been with me for a long time know that I really don't like discussing on social media, on WhatsApp, because I find it very unhelpful. 
you don't really understand what I'm trying to say, you don't understand what I'm trying to ask. So I think it's better to meet up, you know, which is, I think, the model that the Bible has put for us for fellowship. And we should also be careful to avoid debating for the sake of debate. You know, I go to seminary, right? So a lot of this debate is very theoretical. There's no application mode. Just I feel this way, I feel this way, I think uh, engineering is like that, like that, like that, like that, then we cannot sort of move to what does it mean. So even though I say that doubt is not disbelief, but doubt can become an idea. If you are so obsessed, with, oh, you need to keep thinking about this issue. Right? Until you withdraw from people, or you hurt people, or you cause division in the church. So, dealing with doubt uh, that arises from our Bible study or question, basically, as a church, we have to create safe spaces for questions and for doubts. But we must not be judgmental. We must acknowledge that people are curious. And we must and we can get the answers. The second uh, scenario where doubts happen is usually when they're suffering. Something not right in our life, whether it's at work, about health, our loved one's health, about finance, about family, about church. It's always very, very painful. Like I think of uh, my grandmothers. I do not know whether they have come to Christ. I think maybe say not say maybe they say right before they die, you know, maybe share with them. You no, know, some of these things are very personal. And sometimes there's a sense of hopelessness. Or sometimes this suffering is because they're disappointed in people that should know better. Or maybe it's about prayers that go unanswered. So here, um the application is uh, first with Christian Christian, when you see when you see people in suffering. I want to suggest that no need to remind them that uh, Christian life is a man. I think they know that. They don't have to be like, oh, you know, the book of so the Christian life, you can go. You know, these are not helpful because they're already suffering. They know they're suffering. But if you want to be there, be there to listen, be there to pray. No need to give unsolicited advice. And for those of us who are suffering, we have to persevere. We have to rest on God's promises. Faithfulness, deliverance, and focus. Look from our situation to his. It is an opportunity to trust God. That's what Pastor always says. Oh, this great opportunity to trust God. Okay, uh, very positive thinking. But it's true. It's the opportunity to trust God. So not saying it's easy, but it's something that we have to struggle with, with his promises and his will. Number three, doubts can also arise when we, we have some feelings of disconnection. Ah, I come to church, I don't really know what to do here. You know, I don't really know the people here, I don't want to program here. Uh, I'm not really interested anymore. You know, I was at one point, but I'm no longer. I used to have a lot of joy, you know, when I think of God, I'm going to talk about Him, but oh, I don't really have that feeling. But I don't know how that desire. Or maybe the love for God has turned cold. Maybe it has been superseded by other priorities, something that's more urgent, that is valid. More urgent. Okay. So my suggestion here is, of course, as uh, adults, we know that feelings are just feelings, right? Uh, it's important to take action. It's important for us in this text not to give up on fellowship, not to give up on being involved in learning. In other words, come to church, actively serve in church, in your community, even if you don't feel that. So that's the way to maintain until you can rekindle the fire again. In, in the book of Revelation, uh, John writes to the church of Ephesians in the same thing. He said, your love for me has gone to Do the works you did at first. What was it that you did at first? How do you look at your first love? Go back to do those things. Don't get back to in, into action, basically. If you have struggling with feelings of disconnection, don't give up. It's common. We all have that for many, many years. For this period in my 20s, I wanted to totally stop coming to church to take a break. My mom stopped, my sister stopped. My stop, my sister stop. Okay, that's the hobby. I'll take a break today. But somehow, uh, even though I was leading a very decadent life, I still came every Sunday. Uh, and it was not good, of course, leading a dual life. But somehow, it still kept certain things going. Right? So, I'm not saying that this is the right thing for me, but I think it's one way that with this feelings of disconnection. 
Okay, just stick together. Last one, which is probably the most common reason why people have love. You know, when people ask, oh, say, actually what they mean is, am I safe even if I sing? Am I safe even if I go back to my old habit? So on the one hand, failures don't suggest that we are not believers. Like what I said just now, believers are not sinless, they sin less. It's an imperfect world with long way from but on the other hand, we cannot be complacent. This is why I believe that there are so many of such warnings. Well, it's not easy. It's to remind us not to be idle or not to be lax about this obedience. Some of you might have heard this phrase that I refuse to mention until now, which is one safe always safe. I really don't know. Why? Because it took number one, it puts too much emphasis on the safe, not the savior. That's what we need. But as we saw, salvation and eternal security is in right. It's about the savior, it's not about me. Number two, it oversimplifies the issues that can lead to unbiblical application. One safe, always safe, basically can be taken to mean anything to everything. If you're very biblical, you know what I mean? One saved by Jesus, always saved by God because he's so powerful as a God. But there's a real chance of it being applied wrongly as an excuse or permission to continue to sin, which means one saved, always saved, bracket, even if I continue. Nobody will say that to you. But if you don't qualify, if you don't caveat, if you don't explain, so I don't like this simple catchphrases. It's very catchy, easy to understand, but it, it doesn't have real application power if you don't understand what it is. So what happens if we encounter this when doubt arise and they are fallen into an old, old sin, an old habit, old lifestyle? I think the first thing is that we need to take the warnings in the Bible very seriously. In this instance, whether you're safe or not is secondary question. The first question we need to ask is, why don't you want to turn from it? We need to desire the conviction of sin first before we ask about assurance of salvation. I fully believe in this. Which means we need to confess that we can. And if we are struggling with something, I don't think it's easy. I'm also going through a lot of this. But if we cannot change our own habits, change our own sin, we must deal with it. You know, you don't ask questions about am I sin? Because the Bible is clear if you are sin, you have to be sin. So deal with the sin. Don't deal with a bigger topic like assurance of salvation. So that's my suggestion. So what I'm trying to say as I close is that our doubts about our salvation are not purely an intellectual or theological problem. But they have a spiritual, a moral, a practical dimension. When you think about doubt and disbelief, they arise because of specific scenarios that happen in our life. So I want to encourage us to do two things. One is to eat the good food of the spirit in God's word. Rest on his promises. Just now we sang this uh lovely at the end. I don't know whether it's the again. There's a verse that's a lyric that says what will help us to be at the love of Christ in which I stand. So that very nicely touches the promises about what it means to have assurance in God's ability to keep us. So eat the good food of the Spirit, which is God's word. And number two, bear the good fruit of the Spirit, which is how we apply our Christian beliefs, how we apply our Christian values in our workplace, in our home, our friends in church, so that what we believe can be evident in good works to God and men. The good works don't say, but they are evidence of our good. You can't have the fruit without the good, you can't have the good. Without the so, eat the good food, which is the Bible on the left, your right, uh, bear the good fruit of the Spirit, which is the good works, the good attitude, the good values that you can. Show to men and show to yourself. And I think with the fruit and the fruit of the spirit, we can be assured of our faith, the blessed hope in Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you that uh, you helped us today to go through this uh, difficult topic. Difficult, Father, because your truths are profound, they are deep, they are complex, they are not simple, and they are applying to many scenarios of our life, and they are also real. And Father, we just want us, as we study this, as we study this individually and together as a community, we pray, Father, that you will shine your light into the darkness of our hearts, that we can, Father, see the true state of our own desires, our own nature, but more importantly, see, Father, the true state of your desires and your nature. That you, Father, are not over for and you send your Jesus, your son Jesus, to die across the house so that we can follow him, so that we can live a meaningful and holy life for you. Father, pray, Father, that uh, those of us who are having doubts in our walk, a lot of questions, I pray, Father, that you will encourage us that you would uh, keep us and that you help us persevere in our faith. Knowing, Father, that your word is true and that your promises will prove true at the end of this. For this, we ask to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.